you're going to begin. Y'all try to behave yourselves. <laughs> try. <laughs> Appreciate y'all being here tonight. And I'm glad as we have heat. And I don't know what the temperature. What's that? Yes. So uh, I don't know what the temperature is supposed to be tonight, but it was pretty cool last night. Twenty twenty seven, something like that. But uh, it warmed up nicely. So twenty three. Woo. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, Brother David. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's so nice to have heat, and we don't need to take it for granted, that's for sure. Uh, be thankful that we can get warm and uh, have places to go to be warm. We, uh, Sonia and I, went to a restaurant to eat the other day because someone had given us some gifts cards and um, while we were there eating uh, there was a homeless man that came and he was he was sitting in the lobby area and when we got there but after a while they they brought him in and let him sit um, by himself up there let him sit on one of the stools and he just got warm and after a while one of the waitresses brought him some food and uh, he just uh, it was just a reminder that uh, he was just having a time. After a while, he was just, you know, enjoying himself. But for us, we take things for granted like that. Um, being outside in the weather is, you know, something that most of us don't even consider. <clears throat> but um, I was talking with Brandon the other day about the shepherd's table. And by the way, before I forget, <clears throat> we are signed up to begin to serve at the shepherd's table again. And the reason is not because COVID is not rampant, it is. I've had several people to ask me when we would start back. So um, I'm giving the, us the possibility of doing that. Whoever wants to come can certainly do that. But we will begin on the 20th of January. Um, they start at 4 o'clock, so they're asking us to be there at 3.45. Uh, I put 3.35 on here, but it's 3.45. And... Um, and we'll get to serve. If you've never served at the shepherd's table, we don't have to fix the food uh, to cook it, prepare it. And we usually don't have to wash dishes. Sometimes we do sweep or help mop. But um, our main task is to put the food in the trays. And we slide the trays down and make sure it's full. And then we usually take the trays to the tables and fill their glasses and and serve them, make sure that they have something to eat and drink. And then when everybody's finished, we clean up, uh, take the stuff off the table and take it to the kitchen where the person washing the dishes can wash the dishes. And so that starts on the 20th of January next week. So um, consider that. And it's a great ministry opportunity. And also uh, the reason that made me think about it is when it's cold outside, people will come and eat some of them aren't hungry, but they'll come in because it's warm inside, and they will stay for as long as they can until you clean it up and, you, and they have to go outside. And one of, the, one of the, I guess, benefits, I don't know if that's the right word, of going to serve is that we are reminded of how blessed we are. And uh, we have opportunity to help other people, but still it um, teaches us to be grateful for what we have. You know, we take so much for granted. Um, hey, Helen, uh, it's good to see your name pop up there. Mr. James and Jennifer are sitting here in front of me. Um, hey, David, um, and others that I don't see your names, but I see the numbers there. Hey, Tom and Sandy, hope y'all are doing well and staying warm. I don't know if y'all could see or not. We have a fire going. My microphone's in the way. There it is. Can y'all see the fire? They've already asked for recliners. But anyway, um, 
we, we have a fire. <laughs> and what? It is a good idea. Some footstools and recliners and the fire for Wednesday night. If you show up, you, you get that kind of treatment. So we'll, we'll see what we can do. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention to you, we had a church leadership team meeting last night. And um, one of the things that will begin Sunday is a prayer vigil. I don't know the proper name for it, but um, a prayer time, a designated prayer time on Sunday mornings in room 207 from 8.30 to 9. This will be ongoing each Sunday morning, uh, 8.30 to 9. It was something that uh, was on the heart of uh, uh, the church leadership team and um, agreed to, they agreed to start that this Sunday from 8.30 to 9 at two, in room 207. would love to see you to show up and there will be a, a short agenda, a short list of what to pray for specifically. And that will be each Sunday morning, um, Lord willing, from 8, 8.30 to 9. So I encourage you to participate in that. And I mentioned to you about the shepherd's table and uh, a couple other things coming up that you'll hear about Sunday. <clears throat> but um, I just want to share that with you because it will start this Sunday morning. Okay. All right. Well, while y'all are enjoying the fire, I wondered if you have any uh, any uh, prayer concerns tonight. Anything we could add to our prayer list? I wanted to read the names of the ones that we've added. Uh, last night and, and even Sunday, um, so you could uh, add them if you don't already have their names. Um, I had uh, Dan Patrick and Larry Martin. Um, Ian, Ian doing good? Okay. The Young Family, uh, Priscilla Sibley Family, uh, Eric Johnson, all the COVID patients and caregivers, medical people and staff are dealing with all the COVID issues. Uh, Dub Royals, uh, Helen Roberts, um, Barry Bird. This is uh, John Bird's son, Barry Bird. Please pray for he and John Garnett. Um, Steve Harrington. And his name was brought up last night. Let's add him to our prayer list. Um, and and continue to remember Mary Johnson and the loss of her nephew. Uh, Marie Cheadle's had some some physical pain here lately, some uh, pretty excruciating pain. So lift her up in prayer. Um, we have uh, Cecil and Nancy. Is that? Morris, Morris family, Cecil and Nancy Morris family. Uh, Evelyn McCracken family, as we had that service uh, this week, memorial service at Langston. Um, Jeannie Redman and um, uh, Teddy, Jimmy, and Laney have been sick, but they are they are getting better. Uh, so can continue to pray for them, but they are getting better. Uh, Debbie Smith. Also, um, our children and youth and our church in general. Those are the ones that I have to add tonight. Um, also, uh, Ann Nagy, who is the our missionary, international missionary to uh, Bangkok, Thailand, has sent us an update of her ministry. And I shared that with the team last night, and that will be posted right here on the bulletin board. Uh, just, I, I would strongly encourage you to take time to read the the missions and what she's doing on the field. She she is so active in looking for ministry opportunities, and I want you to see that list as we looked at last night briefly, and just see. Um, what it's like to be creative when you're on the mission field and you and I aren't in a foreign country but we are on the mission field and uh, coming up with ideas of how we can minister to, to folks and that's one thing that the, the team talked about last night and uh, will be 
forthcoming. We'll give you some some ideas or some uh, information on what's coming up as far as ministering to our community. All right. Before we close tonight, um, I, we will pray and and make sure we pray over these names and things. Um, all right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's Tony Soros and Don McLeod. Okay. All right, thank you, Judy. Are there others? Okay. Dan Patrick is having surgery tomorrow. Triple bypass. Okay. Karen, uh, what, do you know what time that surgery is? Okay. So we just lift your brother up. Tomorrow he's having surgery. Okay. Any others? Okay, so that's the daughter of Anne Graham Lotz. Okay. All right. Okay. So Don Mashevitz uh, is in, is critical. We'll continue to lift him up. Okay. What else? Okay. I did not know. Thank you, Barbara. Sharon Muir. Okay. All right. Any others? Just a reminder, um, if we don't have updates, the names come off after two weeks. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, it's not important. But if we if we don't take names off, we'll run, we're already running out of room. So... Um, if, you, if you want someone's name to stay on, if they're still in need of prayer, please remind us. Um, because if we don't hear any updates after two weeks, their names are dropped off. So please, uh, please give us updates when available. That would be great. Okay. All right. All right. I hear the fire, and um, and I'm watching y'all. Now, if you start going to sleep, I'm going to play something else like a train coming through a town or something. <laughs> All right. Um, let me pray with you uh, just to get us started, and then we're going to 1 Corinthians 7. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us the way you do and for um, calling us and, and drawing us to you. And I, I thank you, Lord, for a time and a place where we can meet. I thank you for the technology where... Our brothers and sisters can join us all over the world. Um, I pray, Father, that you would keep us close to you, uh, keep us focused on you, and 
remind us to keep our eyes and our hope on on our Lord and and anticipate your coming. And Father, I pray that in the meantime you would find us to be active in speaking about you, sharing the love of Christ with others, um, uh, shining the light that's within us to other people, and um, being lights in this dark world. So many people are, are wandering around, walking around with no hope, no peace, and have no clue of why they even got up today. And I pray, Father, that we would be uh, eager and, and ready to share uh, the love of Christ with others and that hope and that peace that we know about. And Father, I pray that we would honor you in our, with our lives and um, things that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, put your seat belts on. We are going to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, advice on marriage. <laughs> and um, I want you to know this is not the time to elbow people, okay? <laughs> um, and if you are single, there's something here for you as well. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. And if you remember, do you remember what uh, we talked about last week? Anybody remember? James, I'm glad you moved over next to Judy there, since we're going to talk about marriage. <laughs> Y'all remember what we talked about last week? <laughs> yes, yes. Remember Paul talking to the Corinthians about our bodies? We talked about our bodies being the temple. And... Um, Paul was specifically dealing with immorality. He was dealing with people having sexual intimacy with people outside of marriage. Whether they were single or married, they were practicing this. One thing I, I want to remind you of, because we've been in Corinthians here for a while, I want to remind you of what Corinth was like. And I read this a while back, but I don't know if you remember it, and I wanted to just um, refresh your memory on Corinth. And let me see if I can um, find where I wanted to read this to you. Okay, here it is. Now remember, Paul is writing to a specific congregation in Corinth. Okay? A little bit about this church. Okay. Have you ever heard about troubled churches? You know, places people don't want to go? Don't go there. They're terrible. Okay. Well, here's a description of this church and this town specifically. According to his custom, Paul attended the synagogue and took part in its services, seeking to persuade his hearers that Jesus is the Messiah. And when the synagogue was closed to Paul, he went next door to the house of of a synagogue listener who heard and believed a Gentile named Titius Justus. And we talked about that. It's in Acts 18. He was one of many people in Corinth who belonged to the Lord. So there were people in Corinth who were believers. From a human point of view, Paul probably had reason to wonder if many saints would be found in Corinth. The ancient city had a reputation for vulgar materialism. In the earliest Greek literature, it was linked with wealth. Homer, the Iliad. Y'all remember that in school? The Iliad and the Odyssey? Homer's Iliad. You can find it on pages 569, 570 if, if you want to look it up. About Corinth. And or immorality. So it was, it was known for wealth and immorality. When Plato referred to a prostitute, he used the expression Corinthian girl. Okay? Um, the playwright of Philetta Russ, Russ, I know I'm saying that wrong, titled a burlesque play, uh, The Corinthian, uh, which may be translated The Lecher. And Arist Aristophanes coined the verb Corinthian, my, to refer to fornication. According to Strabo, much of the wealth and vice in Corinth centered around the temple of Aphrodite and its thousand temple prostitutes. So this was not a good place. Okay, <laughs> Corinth was known all over for its debauchery. We, we always focus on Sodom and Gomorrah, but they weren't the only two cities that stood out for the bad things that were going on. Corinth was, it was named for that. It, every, it was like a, a euphemism. It was like a figure of speech to call someone a Corinthian. Um, 
It was that it was that bad. Okay, so keep that in mind as um, we move forward here a little bit in the seventh chapter, because in the sixth chapter, Paul is saying he's warning people about their immorality. Well, for them, it's not a big deal. It wasn't a big deal because that's what the whole city was about. I saw a thing this morning about um, John MacArthur, a statement that he made, supposedly. I didn't hear him say it, so, but he made something, a uh, statement, something akin to, if you don't think the world has infiltrated the church, take away the music and put somebody in front of them with the, with the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, and see how many try to sell that, is what he said. And I stopped a minute and I thought, oh, people aren't drawn to the Word of God. They're drawn to being entertained. And that's what he's referring to. People in Corinth, for them, the church and their life at home um, was, was two different things. And Paul's saying you can't live this life. You can't be uh, among the, the culture and be a part of that and still walk with God. So, or walk with Christ. So in chapter 6, he's specifically talking about immorality for those uh, uh, doing so outside of marriage. Verse 19, he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? This phrase I want you to hold on to. You are not your own. Okay? Hold on to that phrase. That is in verse 19 of chapter 6. You are not your own. Verse 20 says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Uh, chapter 7 goes on to say, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, before you all jump to conclusions here, first of all, he says, Concerning the things about which you wrote, uh, if we look over, and I want to do this just as a reference point, if I can find it right now. And, uh, yes, in uh, da, 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 da. chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. If you'll flip over there, 1 Corinthians 16. This is toward the end of this letter. Chapter 16, verse 13. You'll find these words. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all you do be done in love. And verse 15 says, Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanos, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men, to everyone who helps in the work and labors. And I rejoice over the coming of Stephanos, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, because they have supplied what was lacking on your part. This is a reference to them visiting him and bringing Paul the, the questions and the things that the church was wrestling with. Okay. This is a reference here in chapter 7 when he said concerning the things about which you wrote. He talks about it there at the end. Is that these fellows that he's talking about, these people brought me the things that you wrote. And I'm going to address the things here in this chapter that you were concerned about. So the church has written down the concerns they had or the questions or the problems. And these people delivered them to Paul. I believe he was in Ephesus at the time. And now he's addressing the church and the problems that they saw and the things that they have questions about. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, chapter 7, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Let me stop just a second, because we've transitioned from Paul talking about immorality outside of marriage. Okay? And in the town they live in, that's no big deal. There's nothing wrong with it. Matter of fact, it's part of worship to Aphrodite. Okay? So this is a new thing for a lot of people. Paul says you can't do that. He says, however, when we talk about marriage, 
He said, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. He's speaking specifically of sexual intimacy. Verse 4, the wife, watch this, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. What in the world does that mean? Look at the next verse. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I read around this passage and did some studies in uh, some of the concordances and different things. And Paul later in this chapter says, I wish you could be like me. But I realize that that you, some of you can, some of you can't. At this point, Paul is single and he's celibate. He talks about this several times. He says, I, I wish you could be like me. I'm not, uh, I'm not having a, a sexual relationship with anybody. I am focused on my relationship with God. And uh, when you get to this, uh, like verse 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement. Apparently, uh, some of the folks here have decided after they got married that it was the, the better thing to do to be celibate in their marriage. Um, you'll find some of this in some of the history books. Um, Paul talks about it in some of the other places. And Paul's saying, listen, this isn't what we're talking about. Okay, If you're married, the husband's body belongs to the wife. The wife's body belongs to the husband. Remember what verse 19 says? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. There is a theme here, and I want you to see this. When he's talking to the church in verse 19 and 20, he's specifically saying, your body is a temple, and it belongs to God. In these verses here, he's saying, listen, quit um, using it as a weapon. Quit depriving your spouse of this intimacy. Your body belongs to your spouse. Your spouse's body belongs to you. In no way, shape, or form is Paul uh, putting any kind of approval on anything that's abusive or anything of that nature. He's talking specifically about what God intended for the marriage to be. I also want to throw this in here to you as well. In Scripture, when it's talking about marriage, it is always talking about one man and one woman. It is never talking about two men or two women. Um, there are plenty of cases in Scripture that you can find where people went out on their own and they did their own thing and rebelled against God. But when we learn about God's plan, um, His ordinance, the things that He has sanctified, in marriage, it is always a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Now, I want to make that very clear. Unfortunately, you're not going to hear that in every church. You would be shocked and amazed at the churches that you're not going to hear that, and you're going to hear um, that it's okay to have two wives and two husbands, two women, two men. While we are commanded to love everyone, and we don't have an option there. We are to love everyone. We are not to embrace every lifestyle. God's word is crystal clear. A man and a woman. Okay? So that's what Paul is talking about here. Wife, he mentions the wife and husband specifically. Verse 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Come together again lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. One of the things that, that uh, is interesting about Paul, what did he used to be before uh, the Lord stopped him in his tracks? A Pharisee. Absolutely. One of the requirements of being a Pharisee is to be married. The things in, in this day and time, at here in biblical times, marriage. Everybody was expected to uh, get married. They were supposed to get married and being single was looked down upon. 
One of the things that Paul does over and over again is to say, listen, not only is being single something that you can be, in a lot of ways it's something better if you can focus on the Lord and, and just spend your energies focused on Him. I want you to understand that because church life a lot of times focuses on, on the married, not the single. Okay? The Bible has a whole lot to say about single. A whole lot. And Paul here says, I wish everybody could... Now watch what he says and how he explains it. I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. He's saying that um, some have the gift of being single. Some can't. They, they, they need and want to be with, with a partner. Um, Verse 8 says, But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And, by the, and that word means burn with passion, not burn in hell. Okay? Sometimes people go off on a tangent. That's not what that means. And if you have a study Bible, it will explain that or give you some kind of definition that it is to burn with passion. So Paul is simply saying, listen, if you have the gift of singleness, if, if you can remain single and focus on the Lord and, and not have your attention divided, then more power to you. And he says, however, if, if you can't, if that's not your gift, if, if God hasn't equipped you to, to do that and you really long to be with somebody, and specifically in this passage, when he's talking about sexual intimacy, he said it's better to get married than to sin. Okay, that's, that's really what he's saying. Um, there is another place, if I can um, tell you what, go back to Matthew 19. Go back to Matthew 19. And I want to show you this. Uh, Paul's not the only one that addresses this issue. Matthew chapter 19. He was Paul. Right. Matthew 19, verse 8 and following. And you'll find these words. Um, Jesus is instructing his disciples and whomever else may be listening. And this is what um, is said. Chapter 19 of Matthew, verse 8. And he said, Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immor immor immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, Jesus is speaking, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. This is what Paul is talking about. It's a gift. Jesus says, only to those who that it's been given. Okay, He goes a little bit further to say in verse 12, For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. So we have two sides of the same, or I don't know if that's the best way to put it or not. You have the command back in Genesis or not the command, but when God created man, He said it's not good for man to be alone. So He made the animals and brought all the animals, and and um, He saw this is not not exactly all it needs to be. So He created woman, put man to sleep, and 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 fashioned woman. This He said is 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 now a help meet, a help fit. So it is God who established marriage. It is God who put man and woman together. So God is pro-marriage. But I also want you to see here that Jesus himself speaks of a gift of singleness. Those that can remain single should do so if that's what God has equipped them to do. Do you understand that? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, 
Yep. Yes, yes. It's, it's a lot the same that it is today, James, is culture affects the church and instead of the other way around. And a lot of people in Scripture that God used were caught up in that and allowed the culture to dictate their walk with God. And it affected them. I think of Samson. Who was Samson's partner that we talk about? Samson and... Delilah, do you know that wasn't even his wife? Delilah wasn't Samson's wife. His wife was a lady that was um, given to him. And remember, marriages were arranged. And they were having this party. And, and it was a done deal. But uh, Samson didn't do what her family wanted him to do. So while he was gone, off for a while, they gave her to somebody else which ticked him off royally, and he killed a bunch of people because of it. God used Samson to judge people. Delilah was a girlfriend. Okay? That's not God's will. But he used Samson. He used Samson. Paul, the guy writing this, was Saul. He was persecuting the church, doing terrible things to people when God said, I'm going to use you. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? This is what's going to happen to you. You're going to go blind. I'm going to send you this place. This is going to happen to you. And then you're going to work for me. You're going to serve me. That's God's sovereignty. Did Saul Was Saul doing what was right in God's eyes? No. No, not at all. He thought he was. He thought he was being righteous. He was a Pharisee. So, James, your point is, is well taken, is that with Solomon, um, just because he was deemed the wisest man on, on the planet, remember his prayer, his request wasn't for wealth. He was the wealthiest man. His request was for wisdom. So God blessed him with all this stuff, and then he writes about how futile all of it is. And if you read in Ecclesiastes, um, you will see that um, Solomon learned it the hard way. He had all everything that this world could offer. And he said, it's, it's just like a vapor. It's just dust. I learned it the hard way. He said, there's nothing worth anything in this world except God. But it took all this other stuff that he had to teach him. So when he asked God for wisdom, God said, okay, I'll teach you. I'll give you wisdom. This is how you're going to learn. Um... Solomon wasn't the only man that God used. They had multiple wives. But from, from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, God's will, His way, has always been a woman and a man. That's marriage. And that's the family unit He put together from the garden. Adam and Eve. Okay. He used all kind of folks. And he uses us. But... Um, there's nothing I've ever found in Scripture that justified a man's choice to have more than one wife at a time. And I'll get into that later on. A one-woman man is a phrase that's used in the pastorals in Timothy and, and Titus. Um, but God never changed His mind. He never changed His plan. He allowed them to do things um, that they had to pay for later just like He does with us. He'll tell you, this is my will. You may choose to do this. You're going to pay for it. It's going to cost you. And that's, that's what happened to all those folks that chose to do differently. Abraham?
Right. And that was common practice. It was common practice if the wife was barren or they couldn't have children. They, they assumed that she was the one that was barren to give her, to give her husband her handmaiden. That was a common practice. That wasn't just something that Sarah came up with. That was the thing to do. And that's what I'm saying is so many times the people that we read about in Scripture used what they learned excuse me, from culture to try to accomplish the things of God. And we do the same thing. Yes, sir. They are. And you think about Jacob who was later named Israel. Twelve tribes of Israel. They had different mamas. You read about that? Joseph. Joseph and Benjamin had the same mother. Okay? The other boys, you can li- they list that he was married to, to this one and to that one and then to their handmaids. There's four mothers involved there with the twelve tribes of Israel. To me, it teaches me that God is a gracious God, not a permissive God. There's a difference. But a gracious God. A God who can take sinful men and women, teach us, lead us, discipline us, but not give up on us. Um, There's one... No. No. I'll show you something along those lines. If y'all... Oh no, we're going to blame it on you. <laughs> no, it's a good point, uh, James. And I want to show you something. Um, we just finished the Christmas season, but I want to show you something here that goes with what you're just talking about. Um, um, go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Okay, this is the genealogy of Jesus. Now Matthew and Luke record it differently only because um, Matthew starts at Abraham. Okay, to Abraham was born Isaac and it continues on. If you jump over to Luke, you will see that, and you don't don't jump over there, but you can later. Um, uh, Luke starts in the, let me see, um, yeah, Luke starts in the third chapter. Um, he goes all the way to uh, Adam. He goes all the way back to Adam. So there are more people listed in Luke's list because he goes back to Adam. But they are he follows the line of the men, the fathers. Look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, to Ab- uh, verse 2. To Abraham was born Isaac. Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, Judah, his brothers. To Judah were born Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Okay. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron, Ram, and to Ram was born Amenadab. To Amenadab, Nation, the nation Salmon. To Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab. Rahab. Okay. To, and who was Rahab? She well, well, we'll get back to that in just a second. She, she had a bad reputation. Rahab to Boaz was born Obed by Ruth, and to Obed, Jesse, and to Jesse was born King David. To David was born Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. To Solomon was born uh, Reho, uh, Rehoboam, to Rehoboam, Abijah, to Abijah, Asa. To Asa was born Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, Joram, to Joram, Uzziah. Uzziah was born Jotham to Jotham, Ahaz, Ahaz, Hezekiah. It keeps going, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah. Uh, And then verse 12, And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was born Shilti. uh, And it keeps going to... um, uh, Oh, verse uh, 16. Verse 16. To Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. Therefore, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. This, the reason I want to share this genealogy is the women are mentioned. The women are mentioned several times. 
And not all the women mentioned here are Jewish upstanding women. Okay? Why? Why would Jesus' line be identified from people who weren't upstanding Jewish people? To me, it shows God's grace. Okay? If you read Ruth and go back to learn about Boaz and Ruth, um, you'll find that there were people in Bethlehem who looked down on where this lady came from and her people, and she wasn't Jewish, and she certainly wasn't from Bethlehem. God used her. He used her in the line to bring about Jesus. It's all through Scripture. Um, God uses people that are fallible, that sometimes choose wrong, that sin, and then ask for forgiveness and repent. I haven't found anybody in Scripture that was perfect, not one. But I have also not found a God who waffles back and forth. God, is He sticks with His plan. He sticks with His will and His way. From Genesis to the Revelation... God meant for one man and one woman to be together. And that's just the way he's always had it. Right. It was it was just like what we're talking about. Yeah, it was just like what we're talking about Boaz and Ruth. Um, you had to have children to pass on what you had in your line. So if if you couldn't have children and and your husband died, his brother it was his obligation to further the line, and that's why when Jesus uh, my train just jumped the track. Um, that's why when he was cornered and people were asking him about heaven they said well, well when we get to heaven who's going to be a husband or who's going to be the wife or because we've been married you know you marry this person marry that person when we get to heaven who's going to be my husband he said you don't understand the scriptures there won't be marriage in heaven or anybody given to marriage in heaven there's not going to be marriage ceremonies in heaven or that relationship and the reason they were asking is because that was the thing they did. A woman could be married several times to try to further that line. And that was that was the way it was. So sometimes when we look at Sarah and Abram and we see what they did, and it seems so rebellious because God had promised them this long line and heritage of people, you, we have to understand what they did was common practice in their day and time. And how that says, or what that can say to us, is that we need to be very careful that just because it's common practice in our day and time doesn't make it right. Okay? That's a good question. James said, well, if the brother was married and had a wife, um, I think it moved to the next brother if there was one. I don't remember how that goes, James. Um, I do know that if a woman couldn't have a child, she was looked down upon in society. That's why marriage was expected. And being single was the thing that they looked down upon. Okay. A lot of times we have preconceived ideas or notions because we take Bible things and we put it in our day and time. And it wasn't. In their day and time, things were much different. I want you to see in the text today what Paul's writing about. In, in verse 8, we're back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 8, it says, But I say to the unmarried, to widows, that, is a good, that it is good for them if they remain as I am, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. That, uh, that's what it means. One of the things that I want you to hold on to is in the marriage relationship, especially when you're talking about intimacy, um, we still are not our own. We belong to our spouse. 
they belong to us. That's what Paul addresses here. Apparently in this particular congregation, they were doing all kinds of stuff. All kinds of sinful things and crazy things. And using this intimacy as a weapon or just withdrawing from their spouse. And he said, this is not right. It's not good. Y'all need, he said, only, and he lists several things here. And I'll, I'll read these out to you. First of all, he said, if you're going to abstain from sexual intercourse, intimacy, it was to be a matter of mutual consent. You both agree on this. Not just one go off on a tangent and say, I'm not going to be with you anymore. Both of them needed to agree. The second thing was they were to agree beforehand on a time that this was going to start and end. And the third thing he said is this refraining was to enable them to devote themselves to prayer in a concentrated way. Okay, those are the three things. And Paul says this in the way of concession in verse 6, not of command. In other words, he says, if you're going to do this as husband and wife, I'm suggesting that you do it this way. He said, but this is not a command. This is just, I'm just telling you, this would be a good way to do this if you decide that you're going to become uh, celibate for a while. If you're going to remain by yourselves for a while sexually, you need to agree as husband and wife. Okay, he said, but this isn't a command. I'm just telling you if you're going to do this, here's a right way to do it, a proper way. Okay. God is involved in every aspect of our lives. There is nothing in our lives that's just ours. As a matter of fact, there's nothing in our lives that is ours if we're believers. It's all His. Every part of our relationships, our finances, how we respond to this life and struggles and traffic and, and everything else, it's all His. And there's opportunities always to reflect Him or reflect the flesh, me. And I don't know about for you, but that asking forgiveness seems to come more frequently than I want it to. Is saying, I, I didn't get that right. I didn't, I didn't, Lord, I'm sorry. And He is a gracious, gracious God who forgives. The only sin that He doesn't forgive, the unpardonable sin, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, is, is rejecting the Holy Spirit. Okay? Short of that, God is... He forgives. And the only way that He can't is we don't believe on Him, trust in Him, and, and say yes to the Holy Spirit. Other than that, you, you can't outdo God. You can't get to a point to where His forgiveness isn't big enough. There is a time when we test God. Remember, He's drawing us. Don't ever assume that you can wait to your final breath to make it right with God. You can't. Nobody can Sometimes we hear those deathbed conversions, but we can only respond to God when He draws. He initiates that, so don't push that. All right, so in closing, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. God owns us. If we're married, we're not our own. We belong to our spouse. Okay? So... So we can probably understand a little bit better in Romans when it says it's a choice daily to get up on that altar a living sacrifice. <laughs> okay, dying to self, giving for the purpose of others, giving to honor and glorify God, and I'm not my own. And hopefully in all this we can start to see how self-centered and selfish we really can be because we spend so much of our life about me. And, and, and what I want and what I deserve and it's about me and God's word continually over and over again teaches us that we are not our own and we are his he can do whatever he wants to with us was it last Wednesday I get my Wednesdays and Sundays mixed up was it last Wednesday that we talked about um, God telling, telling them that he was the one that uh, made the, the deaf and the blind and the dumb and those that spoke and those that didn't. Was that Wednesday or Sunday? Okay. And I, when I first read that passage, uh, I had to read it again to make sure I heard it right. God is in charge and He's in control and He is not the genie in the bottle that owes us anything. 
He loves us unconditionally, but you and I are here to serve Him and to bring people to Him, honor, honor Him and glorify Him because this place is going to go away just like that and we're created for all of eternity to spend with Him. So we need to be clamoring to prepare for that eternity and to get people ready for that. That's the main thing. And that's what we have to focus on. Not so much about feathering our nest here and, and demanding our own way. And It's not about here and now. It's about there and then. And God's doing a work here and now, but this is not the place of our dwelling and it's certainly not the main focus. And that's why we'll say Preacher Earl... That's why Preacher Earl can give testimony of opportunity to share Christ with his doctors and nurses when he was fighting for his life with leukemia. It was God's will in his life to share the gospel. God allowed that to happen. That's why he can say that. He understands that. Instead of saying, God, have you forgotten about me? I'm supposed to be in good health and making a lot of money and living in a bigger house than I used to because that's what I hear all the time is, if I'm really following you, everything's going to get better. Instead of laying in the bed in the MUSC fighting for his life with leukemia. He understands that the scripture says we are not our own. And we are here to, to make sure this world knows there's something more than just here and now. And there's a living God that loves them. And he can do whatever he wants to with us and in us. For the purpose of magnifying himself. And shining the light toward, toward him. This Sunday, um, the message this Sunday is the end of chapter 11. And I have to give you a little spoiler alert. If you remember, as we've walked through Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is giving this sermon, this powerful sermon, and he has five warning passages, four of which we've already talked about. The whole crux of Hebrews is warning the church not to fall away from their faith because they're being hammered, they're, they're being um, tortured and, and just terrible things are going to happen are happening to them if you and I were writing that sermon and we were just begging people and pleading with them not to fall away from the faith how would you end that sermon would you give them some hope and some encouragement about if you do this, if you stick with the faith this is what's going to happen, and it's going to be a wonderful experience. Wouldn't that be the way you would end that sermon? That's the way I would end it if I was really trying to convince people. You need to stick with the faith and don't fall away. So, so there's a great thing that's, that's getting ready to happen to you here and now. You need to read what happens. You'll see it and hear about it Sunday morning. But it all comes back to this, that we belong to Him. He can do whatever He wants to with us. Because this world is just passing away. And it's all about eternity. It really is. It's all about eternity. And you'll see that in that last part of chapter 11 of Hebrews. Um, you'll think, why in the world would He include this list in this powerful sermon? So anyway. All right. Any questions or comments other than James? <laughs> just kidding, James. Any comments or questions? All right. I'm going to pray with you and close tonight. And um, every time we talk about a text about a marriage or something of that nature, I always feel like there's people that may feel left out. God's Word always teaches us something. So whether you're single or married or single again or never been married or whatever the circumstance or situation there's there's something that we can learn from this text tonight so i hope that's the case for you let me pray with you heavenly father thank you for the power of your word and i thank you father for your will and your way in our lives i pray that you would have freedom um, with us help us not to be those that are kicking against you and and struggling with you to have our own way. I'm so grateful that you're a gracious God and a loving and compassionate Father. Father, I pray that you would um, just teach us to trust you and to have faith in you and look forward to that day when we can be with you forevermore. That is the goal. 
to be with you. Father, I pray that you be with all those on our prayer list, the many that we already have and the ones that we've added and all the things going on in our world, our culture, um, our community, and um, a lot of people without hope and peace. And I pray, Father, that the church would be the, the ones proclaiming how it is that these folks are to have peace and hope. We know. We know the source. And then, Father, I pray that we would be the mouths uh, for our Lord, that we would be the feet and the hands, and uh, we would lead others to the throne and uh, bring people to you and say, here is your creator, and, and Lord, if you just place your faith and trust in him, he wants to love you and forgive you, and help us to, to do that and love people enough to speak up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, Lester Roberts. Thank you, Judy. Eleven, the latter part of chapter eleven in Hebrews. Thank y'all. Good to see you in here.